Hey guys, welcome back. Today let's analyze a paragraph from the Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky, of course. This paragraph has a lot of insight on where victimhood comes from or its ideology. So last week we talked about how victimhood, how we trigger our, our own sense of victimhood by setting this, these ridiculously high goals, having these impossible standards so we can fail and feel like a victim. But how does the victimhood get there in the first place? It gets there the same way for everybody. And it turns out that Father Sosima from Brothers Karamazov knows exactly how it gets there. So quick context on this paragraph, Fyodor, the father of the Karamazov family of the three brothers, goes to Sosima, really is there to... So Sima is going to help them work out some financial dispute that he has with his uh, eldest son, Dimitri. But while he's there, he asked, he asked Father Sosima what he can do to ensure eternal life. And, you know, a Fyodor, he's just embarrassing himself because he's not really religious. He doesn't really practice, but he wants all the, the father, he wants all the priests there at the monastery to think that he's really into it. So, you know, he's giving his signs in front of all the icons and everything. I mean, just, just imagine a white liberal at a Kwanzaa celebration, you know, not not really knowing what's going on, but really wants to fit in. That's Fyodor here. And so what so Sima tells him to do to be a good person or to have eternal life, it culminates in this paragraph. It's book two, chapter two, The Old Buffoon, page 44 in the PNB translation, the Bavir and Volokonsky translation. So I'll just go through this paragraph all at once, and then we'll go through each part individually. So it begins, above all, do not lie to yourself. A man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to a point where he does not discern any truth either in himself or anywhere around him and thus falls into disrespect towards himself and others. Not respecting anyone, he ceases to love, and having no love, he gives himself up to passions and coarse pleasures in order to occupy and amuse himself, and his vices reach, and in his vices he reaches complete bestiality. And it all comes from lying continually to others and to himself. A man who lies to himself is often the first to take offense. It sometimes feels good to take offense, to take offense, doesn't it? And surely he knows that no one has offended him and that he himself has invented the offense and told lies just for the beauty of it. And that he has exaggerated for the sake of effect and he has picked on a slight and made a mountain out of a pea. He knows all that, and still he is the first to take offense. He likes feeling offended. It gives him great pleasure, and thus he reaches a point of real hostility. Hope that wasn't too laborious <laughs> for you guys. All right, let's go through it. Above all, do not lie to yourself. I think this is a, a subtle but a profound point about the nature of psychology and religion in its relation with philosophy, right? The central question of philosophy is, what is reality? What is out there? The central question of psychology is, who am I? To quote, Char <laughs> to quote Charlie Sheen in, in both Wall Street and Major League Two, because he has the same arc in both those movies. Right? Philosophy says to know yourself, you need to know reality. Psychology says to know reality, you need to first know yourself. Well, that's what it's supposed to say, I think, fundamentally. All right, philosophy begins with reality. Psychology begins with the self. Philosophy goes from the outside in. Psychology is inside out. That's why that movie was was called Inside Out. So when Descartes says, I think, therefore I am, this is true psychologically, but not philosophically. It turns out every really bad philosopher was just a psychologist. They didn't know what psychology was at the time. Philosophy would be more, I am uh, therefore, I think. Um, so, yeah, uh, Zosima, he's a priest, right? He's a theologian. Theology is psychology. It just replaced Lord with regulation, God with reality, or really uh, not reality so much, but just how um, how you experience your unconscious when it is in touch with reality. Holy Spirit is the transcendent function, or that, wh that which you... Um, or that which allows you to integrate your unconscious, that which allows you to reconcile opposites, these things that, that seem opposite, the devil is, rep is repressed anxiety, or, or what you do to compensate for your repressed anxiety, the symptoms of repressed anxiety, that's what the devil is, 
and um, psychology and philosophy, you know, they're intertwined, but so seem as a psychologist. So he says, above, above all, do not lie to yourself. Yeah, that's a big topic. I actually got a question about that on, on the exact uh, connection between philosophy and psychology. And I think that's a huge topic. It requires a lot of explication. I will do a video on it in the future, but honestly, that, that feels more like a, a third of book idea. Anyway, he continues, a man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to a point where he does not discern any truth either in himself or anywhere around him. Right? If you cannot be honest with yourself, you cannot see reality. You cannot see the truth. Um, yeah. Well, that's what a bias is, right? That's what confirmation bias is. And all biases are effectively confirmation. They're just rewording or a reframing of confirmation bias. Like, oh, look, there may be a problem with my child. You know, I may have like serious developmental issues or behavioral issues. But if I look at that, then I have to look at my own trauma and how I was abused by my mother or father or whatever. And I don't want to look at that because that's really gross. So I have a perfect child. Or, oh, look, my, my life is falling apart. My marriage is unhappy. But, oh, look, Biden. Oh, look, there's Trump. Let's, it's election year. Thank God. So let's just blame everything on them. Right. It lowers your IQ. Complexes, they lower your IQ. You cannot see reality. You effectively cannot see reality. This is why smart people do dumb things. In fact, they do the dumbest things. Because they have the most horsepower. Right, the horsepower it can get you around the track the fastest, but it's also the most likely to wrap you around a tree. And that's what happens when you have an eye high IQ, but still lie to yourself. So you do all that and thus fall into disrespect towards himself and others. Respect means discernment. You cannot discern if you don't see truth. Or I think maybe just to put it more precisely, you wouldn't be able to to discern enough for it to matter whether to respect somebody or yourself. And if you don't respect anybody, you cease to love, right? With no virtue, with no respect, with no value, there is no love. Love is admiration. Thank you, Aristotle, for being the first one to point that out. Uh, and having no love, he gives, he gives himself up to, to passions and coarse pleasures in order to occupy and amuse himself. And his vices reach a point of complete bestiality. Now, Zosima says the pleasure itself is coarse. Although that seems what he, that's the implication. He equates the passions with coarse pleasures, I think, because he doesn't say coarse pleasures and, and passions. But that's his error, right? That's his mind body dichotomy to say that pleasure is inherently coarse or lower. Which, yes, pleasure can distract you. You can use sex, for instance, to distract you to hurt you, but it's not about the sex. It's about how you use it, use it for the wrong purpose. The dichotomy doesn't exist. It seems like it exists, but it only exists. It doesn't exist in reality. It only exists in your neurosis, but you know, so uh, you know, he's not, per he, this is Dostoevsky. I, I, I keep talking like, so is a real person. This is Dostoevsky. Uh, you know, he just, um, obviously I'm not smarter than Dostoevsky, but I think, he inherited ideas that he couldn't fully expunge from his mind that he was smart enough to. But I just think given probably how his cultural circumstances, whatever he couldn't see otherwise. So, you know, that's why we're here correcting his hairs, his hairers. Okay. And then a man who lies to himself is often the first to take offense. Now I'm going to take some liberties here with that word offense I think in the Russian, it could also be translated to victimhood. And I'm just going to translate it to victimhood, even if it can't. I mean, look, offense is just a politically charged word now. Uh, it's often a, a word that we just uh, ascribe to the other side of the political aisle. Like, oh, look at them. Look at those snowflakes over there getting offended by everything. So I'm just going to say victimhood, and I may insert resentment here and there. It sometimes feels very good to take offense, doesn't it? And surely he knows that no one has offended him and that he himself has invented the offense and told lies just for the beauty of it, that he has exaggerated for the sake of effect, that he has picked on a slight and made a mountain out of a pea. Right? What justifies your victimhood? 
You know your victimhood. I mean, you know that victimhood's wrong. But you still do it. You still justify it. Well, how do you do it? You typically say, well, this situation is different. My situation is special. No, Mark, you don't understand. There really is a deep state. Look at this documentary that I found on BitChute. Or no, Mark, you don't understand. There really is racism. Check out these statistics. No, Mark, you don't understand. Don't you see we live in this patriarchy, this ginocracy? No, Mark, you don't understand. Look at what my ex-wife, my girlfriend, my boyfriend has done to me. No one who's intelligent would deny that oppression exists etern- externally and eternally. Of course it exists. You've been hurt, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't even try to minimize it, right? I think you should maximize it. Yeah, you need to recognize that there is resentment there. There is a sense of victimhood, and you need to feel it. That is part of figuring out who you are, as Charlie Sheen says. And now, but you feel it, look at how you perpetuate how you were hurt. Look at how you perpetuate, continue that feeling of victimhood. Or you could try to eliminate external victimhood, but it's funny, whenever we, we try to do that, it just creates more victimhood, more oppression. It's almost like, I want, yeah, I wonder what that says about the nature of oppression then. Oh, okay. And then the final sentence, he knows all that, and still, he is the first to take offense. He likes feeling offended. It gives him great pleasure, and thus he reaches a point of real hostility, or I would say resentment. So you lie to yourself. Let's go back to that. Uh, right, so you lie to yourself. You cannot see reality. You cannot discern. You cannot love. You don't have virtue. You don't have love. And when you don't have any of that, all you have left is, is victimhood. Right? You don't choose to be a victim. Nobody chooses to be a victim. It's a compensation for what happens when you, for when you lie to yourself. So let's... First, notice how Zosima understands that there is a loop here. He gets the overall neurotic loop. And what is it? Let's put it in his terms. The first step is there's some kind of truth. There's some kind of truth out there that you recognize. I would identify this as healthy anger. The truth is you have healthy needs that you need needs that you need in order to 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 survive and have a good life based on what it means to be a human. And then what do you do with that truth? Is you repress it or you lie. And then what happens is you fall into disrespect. Disrespect for yourself, for others, and then all you have left there is you have coarse pleasures Course pleasures, that's going to be my uh, golf themed strip club. Okay, sorry. Or you feel like a victim. And then after you feel like a victim, what's the belief? What's the belief that you have that you must necessarily have based on these four steps? Well, I'm not going to write it out, but the belief is in effect that like you need to lie in order to survive. Now, how do you tell the truth, though? That's, that's a little bit different because. Um, you know, I've seen people tell what they think is the truth. That they've sworn on their children's life. They would have sworn on the children's life. This is the truth. And then maybe six weeks, six months later, they realize that it's not the truth. They would admit as much. Um, so how do you go about telling the truth? Well, there's five steps to it. Let's go through it like we do. I'm just going to go through this in every video now. Uh, you don't have to watch this, but... You know, this is really important. And maybe it doesn't seem like that big a deal. But your psychological growth, to the extent that you can change, base is based on how well you can talk through these four steps I'm going to uh, talk through here. So facts, feeling, meaning, and responsibility. Okay. So let's talk through this. Let's say the truth from Fyodor's perspective. So what are the facts of the situation? Well, he could say, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get the, the priests here at the monastery to like me. 
right? I want to fit in. I want to curry your favor so you can be on my side in this dispute with my son, Dimitri. I want you, I, I'm acting in a way to get you, the priest, to think highly of me. Right? Those are the facts of the situation. Now, how do you feel about this Fyodor? Or, or what is the feeling there? Well, I don't know if Fyodor would say this, but it seems like there's like a sense of shame there. Right? You, you need to act in a certain way. You need to present yourself in a certain way to be liked, to get what you want, to get what you think you really need. That, that sounds like some kind of dissonance, for, uh, if nothing else, and shame. And so what's the meaning? What does that feeling mean to you? Well, it could mean that you're, you're just not a good person. It means that you're a bad person to your core if you need to act in a way to get people to like you in order for them to see your side in some dispute that you have with your son that you can't even talk out yourself with him. So what's your responsibility for that feeling? How are you responsible for that feeling of being ashamed. Well, what's the benefit? We'll go through the benefit, the contribution, and the relation. Well, the benefit is how you benefit from that feeling is, well, if you feel ashamed, then you don't really have to do the work you need on your, you need to do on yourself because uh, you're a bad person. So it, do, doing work on yourself or trying to be a good person, it's not going to do anything anyway because you, you feel ashamed. So that's one benefit of feeling ashamed is I don't have to, to do anything too difficult. What's the contribution? Right? How do you contribute? That's how you benefit from the, the feeling of being ashamed. How do you contribute to that feeling? Um, a good way to, to look at this is just ask, like, what are you avoiding in this situation? And what Fjord is avoiding is he's been, I mean, there's been enough. It's only page 44, but there's been enough evidence um that Fyodor is holding back or somehow manipulating Dimitri with his inheritance, not giving it to him all at once, giving it to him in a way where he knows that Dimitri is going to spend it frivolously. Right, something to that extent. He's trying to get one over on his son, Dimitri. So how does Fyodor relate with his son, because the conflict here is with his son, Dimitri. So how does he relate with Dimitri? Well, that's more involved. But, you know, they both have feelings of insecurity around money. Right. And I think you can be more honest about that once you once you talk through that. So that's how you talk through honesty. It, you know, it's, it's not going to get you to the truth ultimately, but you do this enough and you begin to notice the truth becomes more clear. You begin to notice your own neurotic pattern here, how you go through this in your own individual way. Um, that gets you to this place of feeling like a victim, right? And, and um, you know, people say that victim was a choice. It is a choice. Of course, it's a choice. You make a choice in the moment to play the victim. Of course you do. But you also make millions of little choices, and some of those choices are unconscious, that culminate, that get you to this place where you're more likely to play the victim. And that's why psychology even exists, right? Like if, if you're in the middle of a swim race, can you choose to win the race when you're in the middle of the race? I mean, yeah, you're able to do some things, right? You can choose how well you focus. Or you can choose how well you, you know, think about your strategy, you can choose how hard you try, like how well can you practice your technique, right? Those are things that you have control over. Those are choices you can make in the middle of the race, but also no, like there's some things that you can't choose, um, like how well you trained, how well you rested. Uh, you know, maybe you, you were in this place that you were stressed out and you didn't know how you got stressed out. So you couldn't rest. You couldn't sleep very well before, or maybe you're just not a good swimmer. Maybe you're just not built to be a swimmer. You're, you're a stocky Armenian Russian guy. You're better off as a weightlifter. You know, what are you even doing in a, a swim meet in the first place? So there's some choices like you, you, you know, you don't have some control over that. And that's the idea behind victimhood. It's like, yeah, you can choose to be a victim, but sometimes you're just in a situation. It overloads your psychology and you can't choose otherwise. Like you're, you're the proverbial, a stocky Armenian guy 
<laughs> who's trying to swim, right? The, the, the choice of victimhood doesn't occur exactly at the place of victimhood. So you got to look at your decisions that lead you up to that, and this is how you do it. This is I'm sharing with you uh, some part of it, some part of the therapy that I do. So you can look at, well, how did I get to this place of victimhood? Yes, of course. What choices can I make differently in the moment? But how about I just not even get to this place of victimhood in the first place? Let's look at that process. And a lot of that, the way you look at that and the way you become more conscious of that is talking through, getting honest, right? Above all, do not lie to yourself. Look at your patterns. Look at how your patterns, how your line informs your patterns, how your patterns inform your victimhood. Then you can really start to take the reins back on your life to, to whatever extent that's possible. Nobody has total control, but you got to be able to adjust your life here and there. And that's what I can help you with. We do free consultations. Join animus.com slash schedule. I do free consultations, which I know has just become a euphemism for a sales call. Uh, this is not a sales call. What I will do is I will share, you, you tell me about your life and I will talk with you. I will let you know what your loop is, what, how you go through this neurotic loop, what it looks like for you, uh, what your healthy needs are, how you repress those healthy needs, what happens psychologically as a result of you doing that, how you compensate for, for the repression of your healthy needs. That's step four. And then, i let you know this is your belief. The belief will be obvious once you get steps one through four. But, but I'll let you know, you know what that is. And I think you can take that loop, take that neurotic loop that I tell you, and apply the information that, that I talk about in these videos. You can get the course too. The course is really helpful. But really, I don't share that much more in the course that I do than I do here in these videos. I mean, I see these videos that I do on YouTube as an extension of the course. Really what the course is good for is it just organizes all this information. So it makes sense. Um, it makes, so it makes sense. Um, anyway, so joinanimus.com slash schedule. And if you want to, of course, if you want to find out more about what I do and how I work, you can ask me questions about that. But I mean, I, you know, I think people see free consultation and they just think, oh, that's a sales call. That's lame. I mean, this is a business. You know, what I run is a business, but in a way, I don't know. It's kind of not. All right. Anyways, thanks for watching guys. Um, and remember, your victimhood, your victimhood was given to you and now you perpetuate it.